Well, again, good to see you and thankful for this occasion. Uh, I'll mention this. I'm sure Brother Barry will mention it in a bit, but uh, this is the third Sunday. And so uh, if you're able to, tonight, uh, Lord willing, after our assembly, we'll have a few minutes and then we'll uh, meet together, those who can. And uh, we have our monthly prayer meeting where we uh, suggest names and uh, pray particularly for some who are on our hearts. Um, and uh, we certainly would invite you to stay and be a part of that effort. We'd be glad to, uh, to have you. It's, a, it's a, an encouraging time and uh, I think very useful and profitable uh, because we uh, believe in prayer, first of all, and secondly, because I think it gives great mutual strength and encouragement. So please do remember that effort, if you will. Uh, we have been studying from 1 Corinthians, and we're at the last chapter. This uh, end of the letter is, uh, contains a number of really good, practical, uh, useful exhortations. And um, uh, so since we've already taken this much time, I guess you won't mind if we spend a little more time looking at this chapter. We have uh, already looked at the first uh, nine verses or so, uh, where Paul uh, gives instruction to the church at Corinth about uh, raising funds for the church's work, and we've talked about that. Uh, and uh, we also uh, looked a bit at, uh, at Paul's own plans, how that he hoped to come there, not yet, but he would plan to come by there. Uh, at uh, the present time, he was at Ephesus. That's the, the place from which he wrote this letter. Um, and uh, he talks about reasons why he's not going to be able to leave at this moment, but uh, he has uh, sent Timothy that way. Uh, we uh, maybe looked at the first part of this passage. 1 Timothy chapter 16 and verse 10 in the old translation reads, Now if Timothy come, see that he may be with you without fear, for he works the work of the Lord as I also do. Let no man therefore despise him, but conduct him forth in peace, that he may come unto me, for I look for him with the brethren. So he writes about really two men. The first we talked about last week, Timothy. Well, you read about Timothy in the New Testament, don't you? Um, we don't have a letter from Timothy, but we have two letters written to Timothy, and we also find him mentioned in the work. He was a busy man for the Lord, and we commend, you know, certainly his dedication. We commend his selflessness. The Apostle Paul did that in Philippians 2. So he's a great example, and uh, the hope was that he might get to Corinth and be able to help with that rather difficult situation. But uh, there was another man that Paul mentions in this passage, in verse 12, as touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren. But his will was not at all to come at this time. But he will come when he shall have a convenient time. Um, in the first place, you know, Apollos was no stranger to Corinth. And uh, if you go back to the history, you go back to the book of Acts, um, and you find here this inspired history written by Luke, uh, we learn about the connection between this man Apollos, who he was, and uh, the church even at Corinth. Look in the last part of uh, Acts uh, chapter 18. Uh, a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord being fervent in spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. That's interesting, isn't it? So here's a man, and he's limited in his knowledge, very zealous, very able, um, but limited in his knowledge until, of course, um, Aquila and Priscilla come and speak to him. Now, when it comes to Apollos, you know, we all remember that expression there that, that Luke uses, an eloquent man, the old translation says, and mighty in the scriptures. We've thought about that. And, and you know, the word eloquent, um, I don't know what that brings to mind. 
I'm not sure exactly what your translation may say. People might think of a beautiful voice, you know, that's very clear and pleasing to hear. Maybe he had that, but I don't really think that's what that word is about. I, I think the word there is, is a word uh, from which we get our word logic. Uh, it, it suggests the idea of one who is learned, one who is skilled in speaking, one who is, is uh, reasoned and rational in his thinking and his approach. Nothing scattered about this man. Uh, but he could follow from point to point to point. And the second thing that's said about him is also, I think, powerful. He said he was mighty in the scriptures. And this is uh, a word connected with that word uh, dunamis. <laughs> you know, dynamite. We get our word from that, that word there. Um, strong. Powerful. This makes really another sermon, and we're not going to try to preach that tonight. But I wonder, you know, how could a man be powerful in the Scriptures? What does it take to be powerful in the Scriptures? Well, you can probably think several things that fit on that list. Uh, one thing is you've got to know the Scriptures. The Scriptures he's talking about here obviously will be the Old Testament Scriptures. Here's a man, and he doesn't even know all he, he needs to know about the work of, uh, of, of, of baptism in the Spirit of God. What he does know is he knows that Jesus is the Lamb of God. He knows the teaching of John the Baptist. And so John has come and preached to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. That's more than they know in those synagogues he's preaching in. And so here is Apollos. And Apollos, whether invited or whether he asked, will go to those synagogues and he will preach powerfully, logically, truly, the scriptures. You, you can just imagine a man who has an intimate and, and uh, encyclopedic knowledge of the prophecies of the Old Testament, and he can go through and show you Jesus of Nazareth in the law and the prophets and the Psalms. Now, that'll move people. You know, they're... <laughs> I'll brag on, on Gable. He ain't here, so I'll brag on him tonight. You know, one of the things I like about Gable is he's a student. There are uh, other young fellows that you may meet, and I'm not the police on this. I'm just saying you'll find them. And they have talent, and they may have the gift of gab, as an old friend of mine used to say. And uh, they have a charisma about them, but they're not students. Now, folks like that can affect people. And there's a place for just good old exhortation. An old fellow that I used to know talked about, sometimes uh, he preached Jericho sermons. He said, that's where you march around seven times and shout. You've heard that. And maybe that has a place. But over the long haul, that won't get it. And, and what we need is we need people who are students of the word and who will grow in their knowledge and will share what they know because the word is the power. It's not the preacher, whoever he is. It's, it's in the word and communicating the word. And that must have been the case with this Apollos. He was a student of the word, and he presented that word and let it affect every honest heart that it found. And so he would have been a man... Uh, of, uh, of knowledge. He would have been a man of conviction. It's one thing to know it. It's nothing to believe it. You know, people can spout off facts. They may have a Bible knowledge, but it doesn't really go deep in their heart. A fellow like that, is, is, he'll influence some, but others he won't be able to reach because he hasn't reached himself yet. And then he needs a courage a courage to be willing to say it even when folks don't like it. I imagine Apollos was all those things and more. Tell the truth as if it matters to you. That's the kind of man Apollos was. So anyway, here's Apollos, limited but bold and able, and he's preaching at Ephesus, and then Aquila and Priscilla, you remember, heard him, recognized a need there, took him aside privately, and instructed him uh, expounded to him the way of God more perfectly, the old translation said. This is one of the examples of how people ask the question, can women teach? 
Can women teach men? Well, an exact answer to that would be, you've got to tell me about the circumstance. Uh, women are not allowed, according to scripture, to stand and to preach in an assembly, to, to take authority over men. But I don't think here there was any thought about Priscilla taking authority over. But here you have this couple who together instructed this godly man and showed him things that he had not yet seen. By the way, there's another mark of greatness. Great people can be taught. Nobody knows everything. Great people can be taught. So, Apollos was a man willing to grow. Now, the point is, when he was, uh, verse 27 of Acts 18, when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace. He was uh, even more effective as a teacher and could take people further because he knew further the way. He mightily convinced the Jews, verse 28, that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. And now look at chapter 19. Just continue the story there. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. Paul and, and, and Apollos had worked some of the same places. I don't know that they had worked together. But they certainly knew one another. And Apollos had been at Corinth, and they knew him. And so it comes up here uh, about Apollos. Uh, something else, another way we know that he was well known there was because you remember in 1 Corinthians early on, one of the problems that Paul pointed out was their uh, habit of following after men and placing men too highly in their thinking. And he said in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians and in verse 12, every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos. He, his name had been hijacked by some there. I don't think that there's any blame on Apollos any more than there was on Paul or Peter. But there were some who had hijacked this man and made him some sort of a, a, a special cult or a, 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 a sect among Christians. And of course that was horrifying. Paul had no blame for him. In fact, he writes here about our brother, or as one modern speech translation says, our friend Apollos. Paul respected Apollos, and Paul wanted Apollos to come to Corinth. That's interesting to me. Uh, maybe the church wanted him too. Maybe the way that he words this makes you wonder whether they had written Paul or requested somehow that Paul might encourage him to come. They wanted him to come back. They thought he could be helpful. Paul thought he could be helpful. Uh, notice the language in verse 12 again. The old translation reads, As touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren. But his will was not at all to come at this time. It sounds to me like they were both pretty fervent, don't you think? Paul said, I really wanted to come, and he was really sure now was not the time to come. But he said, I will come, or I'm sorry, but he will come when he shall have a convenient time. Um, a convenient time. Uh, it's interesting, isn't it? That language, convenient, doesn't it remind you a little bit of, uh, of Acts chapter 24? Uh, when Paul had an audience before Governor Felix and he reasoned with him concerning righteousness and temperance and judgment to come. This is Acts 24 and verse 25. And Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way, for this time when I have a convenient season, I'll call for thee. It's, it's a form of the same word. It's not exactly the same word. It, it just means at a proper time, a set time, a good time. I think these are very different cases, aren't they? You know, Felix, you know, he, his convenient time probably never came. His convenient time was about putting off what was right. I don't think that's at all what's going on with Apollos. We don't have all the details here, but I think it's evident that Apollos' decision was made not on the basis of shall I do right or do wrong, but I have two right things. Now, he was doing work wherever he was. And when Paul said, I really wish you would leave there and go to Corinth now, he said, I don't feel like I can do that now. But I will when the opportunity affords. 
No blame to be had there. I just think it's interesting. You know, uh, if the Apostle Paul told me to put more pepper on my chili, I might be tempted to go and do it if I don't like pepper. You know, I've just... Oh, but he was an apostle. There's no, quest no questioning his authority. But it's a good reminder that he wasn't king of the church. Uh, none of the apostles were. They were the instruments through which God revealed the truth. And the truth that they taught and they wrote was indeed from God. But every judgment that they would make would not be a, a, a miraculous judgment from heaven. And here's an example of that. And there's no blame, it seems, from Paul toward Apollos. He's just saying to the Corinthians, you want him? I want him there too. But he doesn't believe now's the time. I'll tell you one reason why this sticks with me. And, and I think you can relate to this. Uh, you know, sometimes we are faced with one of those decisions. You know, shall we go this way or go that way? You know, fellows who, uh, whose work is in preaching, they may be at a place or they may be doing a work and then here's an opportunity that comes to leave to go to another place. And you got that struggle. You know, what do we do? Do we stay? Do we go? We have two opportunities here. What shall we do? Uh, sometimes you don't have an opportunity. Sometimes folks ask you to leave. But that's in, in a case where you can stay or you can go. And I'll tell you something I figured out about that. I'm not very smart. But I figured out you never will know whether you made the right decision or not. You know, you, you make a decision and you try to make it based on prayer and on what you believe to be best for the work. And if you do that, you've done the best you can do. And you make your decision and you never will know whether if you had made the other choice, whatever it was, how that would have worked out. You just have to make the best choice you can based on what you believe to be the highest principle. That's true. But it doesn't, you don't have to be a preacher. You know, it, families make those choices. Hey, we're here. We got a job offer there. Makes more money. But money is not the only thing involved here, is there? All of, nearly all of us have lived for any time have probably had to make those choices. So we can relate to Apollos here. And I think Paul could relate to it. We just read uh, earlier in the chapter, we talked about this last time. Uh, Paul said um, that I'll see you if the Lord permit, verse 8 of, of chapter 16, but I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost for a great door and effectual is open to me and there are many adversaries. You just have to pray God to give you wisdom. You make the best choice you can. You put first things first. It's not about selfishness. It's about the work and what we believe is best spiritually. And then you just have to ask God to help you with that. And I think that's what uh, Apollos did. And, and we appreciate him the more for it. Uh, he had more than one opportunity to teach and he felt like where he was was the more important opportunity at that moment. Um, so, let's uh, go back to our text now in 1 Corinthians 16 and look at verse 13. And as he's winding down the letter, you find these great exhortations, these, these brief but, but meaning-filled exhortations, like we find in verses 13 and 14. Watch ye, the old translation reads, watch ye, Stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. All things be done with charity. There are five things, five exhortations that he gives in this passage that uh, I believe apply to every one of us as much as they did to the Corinthians to whom it was first written. In the first place, he says, watch. Watch. It's a great word. Uh, used a few times in the New Testament. Uh, to watch in the sense of to keep awake. Don't be asleep. Uh, it's uh, used by the Lord. This is the same word in, in Matthew 26 in verse 38. Watch with me, he tells Peter, James, and John. Um, so watching, being aware, being alert. Um, one fellow wrote about this. It denotes attention to God's revelation or the knowledge of salvation, a mindfulness of threatening dangers which uh, with, with conscious earnestness and an alert mind it keeps it from all drowsiness and all uh, slack slackening in the energy of faith and conduct 
Think about how that applies to your life. I'm talking to me. I'm talking to every young person in this audience. I'm talking to every older person in this audience. And whoever's in between the cracks there. How, do, how does that exhortation fit in your life? Watch, watch. Well, I mean, there are several uh, applications we can probably think of pretty quickly. We need to be watching for the truth of God, listening for it, awake to it. We need to be watching for the wiles of the devil. We need to be watching, like Jesus said, for those wolves in sheep's clothing. We need to have a, a, a loving attitude toward others, but not naivety, not uh, accepting just whatever we hear, whatever comes along. We need to be looking for those, watching for those open doors that, that Paul wrote about earlier in this chapter. I wonder how many times the Lord has opened a door that I was too busy to see. You drive by somebody, if you're like me, I, I, I'm bad about this, I'm trying to do better. You drive by somebody who's waving and honking at you. Didn't you see me? I didn't see anything but the middle of that road and my mind was somewhere else. Well, you know, that may not be the best, but that's a whole lot better than God sending me an opportunity to teach somebody or reach somebody or help somebody and I'm so wrapped up in me that I don't see it. Just stop for a minute. Think for yourself. You know, did that happen last week to you? Can you look back and see maybe a time when that would have been the case? Watch. But, but I think one of the ways in which this word is used in the New Testament, and it struck me when I got to thinking about it, uh, was um, uh, the way it's used in, in the book of Mark, the 13th chapter. Mark 13, I think Jesus here is, is talking about the coming of the Lord and uh, the, the, the judgment of God. Uh, verse 32 reads, watch, I'm sorry, verse 32, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son but the Father. I believe we know what day that is, the day when the Lord will come, the day when the, the, the final coming of the Lord will be. But look at what he says in verse 33. Take ye heed, watch, and pray. Same word. For you know not when the time is. What he's saying to me, the Lord is saying to me, is you need to be watching for the coming of the Lord. You don't know when it'll be. It may not be in your lifetime. But you need to spend your time watching. You ever notice how many times we find references like that? I'm going, not going to read them all. But let me ask you to turn over to Philippians chapter 3 right quick. Uh, in Philippians chapter 3, this is a great uh, passage where Paul writes about, in contrast to the world whose God is their belly, he says they, they mind earthly things. They mind earthly things. That describes most everybody. But not Christians. Verse 20, our conversation our, our community, our citizenship is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I think some of the translations, I think it was the Net Bible who reads there, maybe yours does too, it reads not look for the Savior but eagerly awaits the Savior. Eagerly awaits the Savior. Look in Hebrews chapter 9. The writer of Hebrews toward the end of that great book in Hebrews 9 and in verse 28 reminds us of the ultimate sacrifice. Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And notice, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Jesus is going to come to bless those who are looking for him. In 2 Peter chapter 3, the last chapter of 2 Peter, and in verse 13, toward the end of this letter, he writes about a day in verse 12, when the heavens will be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat and the earth and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Nevertheless, verse 13, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth 
wherein dwelleth righteousness. Maybe I'm pressing that expression too far. But I think it's not just a matter of knowing it, but we're looking for it. And I got to thinking when I was reading those verses, is there a day that goes by in my life that I'm not looking for that? Uh, maybe you've had this experience. I, I've, I've heard of people who, uh, when uh, maybe the thunder came out of nowhere, they, they wondered that might be the Lord coming back. Well, he is coming back one day. But I think that there's nothing superstitious or out of place with Christians who on a regular basis remember, I'm going to make my plans and I'm going to do the best I can to try to be useful and organized. But I do understand that we may not see tomorrow. That nobody may see tomorrow on this earth. It may be gone by then. I'm not trying to predict or, 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 or uh, identify the date, the time, but no man knows that time but I believe the Lord's coming again. And I think also, if we think that way, we're going to live a different way. What if today is my last day? What if this is the last Lord's day anybody will ever know on this earth? Am I pleased with the way I spent it? Those are questions that I think are implied in this idea of watching the way the Bible uses that term many times. Watch. The Lord is coming again. Watch. Another term, the second term he uses back in our text is, he says, I want you to stand fast. Uh, to stand fast. The word here is steko, and it's a form of the word histemi. I don't like to use a bunch of foreign words for no purpose, but, you know, that is a word that might sound a little bit familiar. You ever heard of an antihistamine? <laughs> Did you know that was Greek? Uh, you know, I'm going to give you my medical knowledge now. You know, but when you when you exposed to some allergen, all the little whatevers that stand up, you know, and make your eyes water and make your skin itch. A little something, you know. Uh, an antihistamine is supposed to make them not do that. But that's the, the idea of this word, this word stand. And what he's calling on us to do is to stand, to be known, to act. Uh, and that's the, 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 the meaning here. Stand. Particularly stand in, in, as, as opposed to being swept away. Some of the modern translations read this way. Unmoved in the faith. Or stand firm in the faith. Or hold firmly to your faith. How are we doing with that? I can ask these young folks who have started back to school, how are you doing with that? All of us, any of us who go to a workplace and work, how are you doing with that? Are you a person who stands for the faith? What are some things that, that tempt us to move from the faith? Well, a number of things. Persecution certainly can. Uh, Matthew chapter 13, uh, this is the great sermon that was preached there about the parable of the sower. And some of that seed, you remember, will fall on stony places. And in Matthew 13 and in verse 20, he that received the seed in stony places... The same as he that hears the word and anon with joy receives it, and yet he hath no root in himself, endures for a while. For when tribulation and persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is offended. Persecution comes, and we get quiet. Or we, we wander off. It can happen. It's happened to a lot of people who uh, just weren't ready for the moment. I'll tell you a fellow who was ready for it. That was the Apostle Paul. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, one of many passages we could read, Paul was not a man unwilling to stand when things got hot. 2 Corinthians 4, um, well, in verse 7, verse, verse uh, uh, 9, I guess we could start there. Persecuted, yes, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. The problem is on the judgment day, what excuse am I going to make? And there's Paul standing there. What excuse am I going to make for my cowardice? What excuse am I going to make for being moved away how hard is it for the devil 
to discourage me and to frighten me off. Just a little, little, little gust of wind and I'm gone. And there's Paul who would say, no matter what comes, we hold fast. Verse 16, for the which cause we faint not. Our outward man perishes, but our inward man is renewed day by day by day. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. We're not looking at what's seen with the eye. We're looking at what can't be seen with the physical eye. These things are temporal. That's eternal. Uh, stand. Paul wasn't just talking that game. He lived it. He believed it. I think sometimes it's just a fatigue in being different. Don't you think that might be a part of what James is referring to back in James 4? Um, know you not, brother, that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Why would any Christian be a friend of the world? Well, maybe just because he's tired of being the enemy of the world. You are going to be the enemy, aren't you? If you stand up for Jesus, that certainly is true now as it's ever been in my lifetime in our society. In John 15 and in verse 19, one of the last lessons that the Lord taught the disciples was this one. He said in verse 18 of John 15, he said, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I've chosen you out of the world, Therefore, the world hates you. It's one of the things that's so backward about our thinking as parents. We want to protect our children, make sure they don't stand out. If they don't stand out, they're not doing right. If they don't dress different and talk different, and if they just fit in with everybody, something is horribly wrong. And I know it's hard on young people. It's not easy for anybody. But it's a lesson that must be learned. Learn to stand. We're not standing if we're floating away with the, with the current. And that builds a strength in us. But if we get tired of just fighting the fight, there's no hope for us. Lust of the flesh. You know, Achan, he saw that gold, he saw that silver, and he saw that Babylonian garment, and he thought, I've got to have that. And the world will be glad to present to you all kinds of things that are forbidden and tell you it's great for you. Reminds me, too, of uh, uh, the story in Genesis 3. You know, Eve knew exactly what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was. It was forbidden. It was forbidden by God. It was off limits. But what seems to have made the difference was the serpent who just kept talking. And worse, she just kept listening. You're really deprived, aren't you? It's so sad. You can't have what's good for you. Oh, God just wants to keep what's good for you. You've heard that serpent's voice, and I have too. We have heard it ourselves. And what we've got to be willing to do, you know, the devil tried that same nonsense with the Lord uh, in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4 and uh, made a lot of promises that he, was, he couldn't keep those promises. He lied about having the power to do this, and I have that, and I just give this to you. If you just fall down and worship me, and the Lord said, get out of here. Get away from me. Point's been made before, but it's amazing, the power of propaganda. By the way, if you, if, if you need a reminder of that, just look around in our society. Things that 40 years ago, everybody knew that's wrong, but after having 40 years of people tell them it's not bad, it's, in fact, it's good, it's great, and it's wrong to oppose it, suddenly now popular opinion is swung around. Don't think that can happen to us. Just keep listening to music that has an evil message and television that has an evil message and movies that have an evil message. And, and over and over again, make these people our heroes, make these people our, our, uh, our instructors, and just watch and see if you're standing in a very different place than you were when you were just listening to God. It, happened, it can happen to any of them. Stand fast, Paul said. That's right. He goes on to say, and back in our text in, in 1 Corinthians 16, quit you like men. That's the old translation. Uh, and people have sort of uh, wrinkled their nose about that old translation. But actually, you know, the word quit there is not, of course, meaning 
uh, to give up. But it's a, sort of a shortened version of a word that we still use, acquit. To acquit oneself. And one of the definitions of acquit, we might say uh, that uh, maybe in sports, that player, he's a young player, but he acquitted himself well in the game. Uh, we know what that means, I think, by and large. We don't use that word a lot, but we think it means he did well. He performed well. Actually, this phrase, quit you like men, comes from one word in the original, and that word has at its root the idea of acting like a man, a man, anner. Act like a man. And we know what that means, I believe. I don't think that that's uh, trying to exclude, uh, in this case, women. It, from, you know, we all are called to act like men in that sense. But act like men is opposed to acting like a child. Uh, not uh, easily defeated. Mature. Uh, again, the idea of strength. Uh, Mr. Thayer says to show oneself a man to be brave. Uh, to behave oneself with wisdom and courage as opposed to being a babe or a child in Christ. And, and that's exactly the case. The, the word is, is used in the, not very often in the New Testament. In the Old Testament it's used a few times. Um, back over in the book of, uh, of Deuteronomy, when uh, Joshua is called to replace the work of Moses in terms of leading the people, um, you have your Old Testament there in, uh, in Deuteronomy 31, and uh, in verse 3, the Lord God, thy God, he will go over before thee. Uh, Moses tells Joshua. And will destroy these nations. Uh, you will possess them. Joshua will go over with you. And the Lord said unto him, uh, I'm sorry, and the Lord shall do unto them as he did to Sihon and Og and the Amorites. The Lord shall give them up before your face, verse 5, that ye may do unto them according to all the commandments which I have commanded you. And now verse 6, be strong. There's the word in the Greek Old Testament. Be strong. Quit like men. Act like men. Behave yourself in a manly, in a courageous way. Grow up and act like it. You know, it reminds me of, of what Paul told uh, his son, uh, Solomon. Uh, he said, I'm about to go the way of all the earth, 1 Kings chapter 2. And so he says, be strong and show yourself a man and keep the charge of the Lord your God walking in his ways, keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, his testimony. None of us know how we're going to leave this life. We may go suddenly. We may, you know, we, various things can happen. We understand that. But I hope I've got enough marbles left in my head, if the Lord wills, when I'm about to leave this life, if I'm able to communicate with my children, I would like to say exactly what David said to his son Solomon. After I'm gone, for your sake and for the sake of what's right, do not forsake the Lord. Be mature. Put the Lord first in all that you do, wherever you go. Finally, he, he, or not finally, but another thing, the next thing he says is be strong. Be strong. Uh, that word strength to be fixed, firm, steadfast. Um, again, what are the things that uh, make a person strong spiritually? We can add a long list to this. Well, not. Uh, but certainly faith in God and his power, a knowledge of God's word. We talked about that a little bit. Prayer that connects us regularly with God. I just would ask you the question in passing, and I would challenge myself the same way. Do you spend time every day in God's word? Every day. And do you spend time every day praying to God? Schedules can get tight. Things can happen. But do you, do you make it a commitment? We eat every day, don't we? Nearly. Uh, go to sleep every day or try to. Make it a part of our daily, if we just have a few minutes, to use time reading God's Word, praying to God, meditating on what God has said. If you want to get strong, it doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen uh, coincidentally. It, it, it's, a, it's an effort that we make, that people have always made. Making that commitment to grow. As a whole, the church at Corinth was not a strong church, by the way. 
uh, you know, Paul in, in chapter 3 and verse 1 had said, I can't talk to you like spiritual people. I have to talk to you like carnal people. Babes in Christ. I guess the real question that this whole letter has reminded me of is this. How strong is the church here? And how strong am I? And am I a part of the solution or the problem? That, I think, is, is a great value of reading letters like this. That's why they were given, I think. Not just to tell us about what happened back yonder, but make us think about who we are and where we are before God. Okay, I want to stop there. We have our uh, uh, prayer meeting in just a few minutes, and I'd intended to finish this up. I do plan to, Lord willing, one day. Uh, maybe one more, and that'll be it. But I thank you very much for your kind attention, as always. And I hope that maybe this letter considered uh, presents a challenge to us and one that will help us to desire to be better as children of God. There's room for all of us to be better. If you're here tonight, you're not a child of God. Why not tonight? Why not tonight obey the gospel? Maybe as one who is a child of God, but you've not been faithful to the Lord that you promised to serve, then why not tonight? Come to him. Come back to him, I should say. And uh, he longs to receive you. Uh, the, the hindrance is not on his end, it's on ours. So why not remove that hindrance? Why not come back to him? And uh, we'd be glad to pray with you, pray for you. Let us know how we can help you, even right now, while we stand, while we sing. Someday you'll stand at the bottom.